Hi, welcome to Israel First Television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today, but she says hello to you. We're the program that looks at Israel. We look behind the scenes. We look at the news and what's happening here in the land. And welcome to Jerusalem. And uh, we have a very special guest in the studio today uh, from the Jerusalem City Council, and he is Rabbi Aaron Leibovitz. So thank you so much, Aaron, for coming across today. Pleasure to be and, here. And uh, being with us and being our guest on the Israel First TV program. Um, and uh, for our viewers, uh, uh, Rabbi Aaron, was a, you're originally from Berkeley in California, and you're the founder and director of Sunam Yaakov Yeshiva. Uh, you're, um, I guess this is still correct, you're the secretary of the U Yerushalayim party and uh, you are a Jerusalem city councillor. You sit on the Jerusalem uh, council and help with the management of this uh, great city. Um, you were uh, previously the rabbi of the Kol Rinar synagogue and um, also the Derek Etz Hayim Yeshiva for eight years and the founder of Synergy Training. Now, Rabbi Aaron is featured in The Voice of Israel, The New York Times, Times of Israel, The Jerusalem Post, and you've recently, uh, uh, Rabbi Aaron, you've recently been in the BBC News That's correct. in the United Kingdom. You, um, you were featured uh, in, uh, on BBC for, it says, the BBC's title was uh, Israel in Food Fight Over Kosher Licensing because of your work um, uh, with the alternative to the rabbinet, the, the uh, kosher certificate for um, restaurants and um, um, uh, eating places. So uh, th it was amazing. I found this, uh, this news article uh, that Rabbi Ar Aram was in. So maybe as we introduce the uh, audience to you, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. You're from America and how you came to Israel and uh, then a little bit about and then a little bit about about the work of the yeshiva, so. Uh. Okay, so, well, I was raised in Berkeley, California. My father was the Orthodox rabbi in Berkeley. And I was raised in a, in a Zionistic family. The question wasn't whether we were going to move to Israel, but when. And in, uh, in 1976, actually, when I was in third grade, we spent a year here in Israel. And seven years later, again, a sabbatical, a sabbatical year in Israel. Uh, which was 1983, in which, uh, you know, and at that point, my family spent a year here, and at the end of that year, I announced I'm not going back. So You're so not going back to the United States. I, that's right. I was, I was basically, I was in 11th grade. Uh, the family clearly was going to come and live in Israel at one point or another, and uh, I was happy here in high school. I really had found, had, you know, the, what, what began as a very rocky transition, you know, by the end of that, of that year, I really felt very much at home. And... Um, I kind of challenged my family. I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here to stay. And, um, and sure enough, thank God, my family actually came on Aliyah, uh, immigrated to Israel at the end of that, uh, of that year. So I was here alone for one year, um, served as an officer in the IDF, in the educational force, you know, really fascinating service, working on Jewish identity and democratic identity with officers in the, in the, in the, in the IDF helping them understand the Arab-Israeli conflict and the, and, the, and the complexities and how it's couched in history. Um, and um, following that, really, really stayed in the, in the area of education, um, actually higher, higher Talmudic religious education, and um, founded a number of educational institutions. I'm privileged to have ordained 22 rabbis in, in, our current, in my current uh, rabbinic college. And um, it was like 2011 where I was, uh, where I was you know, kind of a, a, the, the activist in me, which I suppose was dormant from my Berkeley childhood. The activist in me was, was, was awoken. Um, because in, in, in the time that you were living in the States, there was a lot of, uh, in California, that was a time of uh, a lot of activism so about a lot right. of issues. Well, Berkeley was really the cradle of the anti-war movement. Um, and I grew up in Berkeley in the 70s, but Berkeley was still really in the 60s. So the was 70s. that was that like the hippie? Uh, the, the, yeah, that's the, right. That's the hippies right. And, and you know, and, and the, the hippies in Berkeley lasted about 10 years longer than the rest of the country, and that was the environment that I grew up in. Um, but really, I had gotten into into religious studies, and had chosen you know a uh, uh, a spiritual path. Um, and then in the summer of 2011, really around the housing protests um, here in Israel, uh, it, was, it was a huge which, wave. Which, which was because people can't, uh, because of the cost of houses in, uh, in Israel, it was very, for young couples especially, to That's find right. somewhere to live and 
to come into Jerusalem or Tel Aviv and to find a you know somewhere suitable to live as a married couple, it's very it's, it was very difficult. That summer, basically, the, the Israeli middle class um, took to the streets to express their frustration that the lives they imagined for themselves seemed out of reach, and particularly owning a home. And it was a huge wave of protest. Um, I became a consultant to the Jerusalem uh, protest site, specifically on, on terms of how to deal with Jewish holidays. Um, the fast day of the 9th of Av, which is a fast day commemorating the destruction of the temple, falls in the middle of the summer. And they weren't quite sure what to do in the protest site because the protests were an encampment. Um, you know, many people don't realize that the, uh, the uh, model of Occupy Wall Street, which happened in the U.S. a few months following, was actually modeled after what was happening here in Israel. And people had taken to the streets and put up tents. And, um, you know, I've always been very involved in religious and non-religious or observant and non-observant dialogue and communication. And they brought me in to discuss with them, how do we observe a fast day in this space of protest, which is, which is shared between people who are going to be fasting and people who are not. Um, and I've, I met a, a group of young activists in, uh, in Jerusalem. You know, I was probably at, you know, at least two decades older than many of them. And, um, and at the same time, I, I realized that we can't just cry over the, the destruction of the temple. We have to really rebuild society and rebuild a just society and um, became part of that, that group, who are known as Yerushalmim. By the way, I'll just uh, add that uh, in, in the intro, um, I'm, I've been promoted in Yerushalmim, actually now the head of the party, not, not, not only the secretary of the party, but actually the head of the party. And I'm now serving on city council, representing um, that, that powerful group of idealistic uh, Jer Jerusalemites. And, you're, and the Jeru Jerusalem Mim Party isn't just uh, in the city council. I understand you also have a member of parliament. Is that right? So Rachel Azaria, uh, Knesset member Rachel Azaria, Rachel Azaria, who founded our party, has, uh, has taken a seat in the Knesset um, as part of the Kulanu Party, led by the uh, uh, Minister of Finance, Moshe Kachlon. And, um, and she is still very involved in everything we're doing in Jerusalem. So for sure, since the last time we, we met, uh, the Jerusalem Yerushalmi party has taken a step up and become and and, and uh, become active. We were always were active in national issues, but now we have a representative in the parliament as well. Now, people who will be watching, uh, we'll have viewers from all over the world who are watching, and uh, you'll be interested to know what it's really like to be in Jerusalem because uh, the media, which is normal in a way, tends to focus on uh, what's happening in East Jerusalem and when there is terrorism or things happen. But what's the reality? Because there's so much construction going on, there's uh, the new uh, bus station, the new railway station, the light rail's expanding. So there's a, there's a really fantastic uh, developments going on, in, isn't it, in, in Jerusalem? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Jerusalem is, is in the midst of a, of a uh, really a, a revolution, in, you know, both in, in transportation uh, transportation, intercity transportation and inner city transportation, both uh, through railways which are being built, um, light railways and heavy railways. Um, there's the business development um, at the entrance to the city which is going on. There's housing development which is happening. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we've also made, made significant inroads into East Jerusalem, into those communities in East Jerusalem which are interested in coexistence and understand that it's in their interest to work with the municipality. and. Um, so I think that Jerusalem, the day-to-day -day in Jerusalem is probably very different and much more positive and optimistic than what many international viewers are exposed to. And, and some of that isn't their fault in one way because if they're exposed to the media, they see all these scenes and they don't really realize. But when they come to visit Jerusalem, um, they've got the light railway now. That, that's fairly easy for tourists there. Absolutely. The light railway takes you, um, you know, in, in, in very, very quickly to all of the major tourist, to tourist attractions um, or, or their walking distance from the, from the light rail lines. Um, Jerusalem is, is uh, it, it, it's, it's a safe city. It feels like a safe city. It's not, um, you know, despite the fact that the media uh, looks, looks to highlight, you know, any, any particular incident, the overall sense is a city which has very, a very, very low crime rate, almost no violent crime. And, um, and you know, if there are security issues, they are very, very contained and, uh, and minimal, thank God. And the, new, the, the security is always being uh, looked at. You've got new, a new camera system 
I understand that's not just in the old city, but it's being installed into the new city to help with the uh, security issues and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's also the cameras and it's also the tremendous the, the tremendously uh, you know experienced and adept security forces that that, that 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 keep us safe on the streets. You know, they are very visible um, since since uh, you know the wave of attacks which we experienced. Uh, you know. Uh, um, you know, it's already been months that things have been have been much much calmer and quieter because I think there's a much a much uh, stronger p presence of police and military um, in the sensitive in the sensitive spots. But it's certainly, certainly, what I hear from people that visit visit uh, Jerusalem from many many international cities is that they feel safer walking in this city than they do in other cities. You know, I'll tell you that my my uh, my my young my my 11 year old son was out with his youth group until 11:30 at night uh, a couple weeks ago, and my wife and I uh, went to sleep calmly, uh, you know, and knowing that he would let he would he would come home and let himself in and just whisper to us that he's home and everything's okay. Um, I don't think there are there are many, and and, by, and we live close to city center. We live in, in 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 the municipal, the business the business district. I don't think there are many cities in the world where parents would feel comfortable with their with their child walking. Walking the streets late at night. Not not after not late at night. No, and um, it's very interesting we're talking about the light railway and the uh, old city. What people might not realize, uh, Rabbi Iran, is that uh, um, Jerusalem is like you've got the old city with, with uh, the tourist attraction, the Western Wall, of course, to to visit, and then they can take the light railway and go and visit the new city. They can come into uh, <coughs> absolutely shopping areas and shopping and areas, see. museums. Um, historical, uh, the Holocaust Memorial, the uh, you know uh, the the place where Herzl and many many of the founders of the State of Israel are buried, which is an amazing walk through history, um, and the museums, and as a matter of fact, we're also we also hope that within within uh, within a short year there will be there will be a public rental of bicycles for tourists, where they'll be able to you know to swipe a, swipe a credit card and pick up a bike automatically, and uh, you know as as exists in many cities in the world. And um, and you know, another way to, to, to mobilize to, to 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 be mobile between these different sites. Is this going to be an electric bike or a, a, a put what we call in England a push bike? No, no, we're not we're not looking at electric bikes. And uh, you know we, the, the, we the, we've mapped out the routes in Jerusalem, which are which are which are fairly level. You know, by the way, it's a myth that you can't ride bicycles in a hilly city. I grew up in Berkeley, which is near San Francisco, and we all rode bicycles. Um, that's what the gears are for. Um, but nonetheless, we've mapped out routes um, in Jerusalem, which are fairly level. And you know, anyone who's taken the light rail in Jerusalem knows that there's very few uh, ups and downs on that rail line. And it's really just a matter of knowing what route to take to get to all the major attractions. And uh, what uh, people who've never visited Jerusalem may never have experienced the atmosphere of the old city at night and, or, or on Shabbat or going to the Western Wall. And uh, so, so many wonderful experiences in, in, in Jerusalem that that they can, and the, the, the Mahanuda market, w which you're not far from, the, which they call the, the Shuk in, um, in, in Israel. And there's so many different things they can go and do. And uh, I think the diversity on the streets of Jerusalem is really you know, something which is, uh, which is very unusual. Um, mm -hmm. And even the diversity between conflict groups, um, whether it's East Jerusalem residents, Palestinians, Arabs, and, uh, and Jews and Israelis, um, whether it's between ultra-orthodox and non-ultra-orthodox uh, non Jews, whether it's with the Christian community, you know, really the day-to-day -day in Jerusalem is is, is quite inspiring. Um, you know, for a city that's named uh, for the word shalom, for the word peace, Yerushalayim, uh, and has in such an image of a city uh, of conflict and strife and violence, not to say that there isn't that side as well, but the day-to-day -day experience, what you feel walking on the streets, um, is is can be quite messianic if you open your eyes and take it in and appreciate, you know, just just how many different worldviews coexist and on the, the level of day to day life, um, truly live in uh, live together. Um, and uh, when when they come, when you come to to visit Jerusalem, it's you're walking in the footsteps of the Bible and you're looking at things which have been written about and you're looking at the city of David and uh, fantastic and the. Uh, it, and the, the Temple Mount and all of the, all of the things you can go and see in the old city and um, a fantastic Absolutely. experience. Absolutely, it uh, definitely brings history to life, um, and it brings the words of the prophets, which speak about the, the which 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 foretell the return of the, the people of Israel and um, and and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of Israel. 
So you're walking, you're, you're, you're really walking in thousands of years of history, um, certainly Jewish history, um, and of course Christian history as, as well is, 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 all, is all present here. And um, so, you know, anyone who hasn't been, who hasn't yet been to visit, you know, I, I definitely, you know, I definitely suggest, suggest that you make your next uh, vacation destination um, in, in Jerusalem and Israel. And uh, you know, discover you know what, what what the real city is like, not what's not what's portrayed in the media. Now, uh, working on the being in in Jerusalem, where which is such a dynamic city, and uh, you know, a city in the news all the time, and you're working now on the city council. What's what's it like to work day to day uh, in in this environment where you've got the not just the pressure of the politics and all the administration, but you're in a in a city of so many. Things happening all the time. Yeah, well, city council is quite a challenge. First of all, um, it, there, there are there are uh, adversarial conflict groups in this city. Um, the current mayor Nir Barkat, who's brought many gifts to the city, um, also chooses to lead the city with a very broad coalition. Um, so right now, out of out of thirty one members of city council, there is one city council member who is in the opposition, and the rest are part of a coalition. Which, which doesn't always lead to a peaceful day to day because it means that those of us who, who are in disagreement over issues um, are sharing seats in the coalition, in the governing coalition. And, and it's, it's um, the, um, you know, I wanna point out also that Jerusalem is unfortunately a poor city. Um, as a matter of fact, um, this week, uh, huge news is breaking that Jerusalem is going down one point in its socioeconomic uh, uh, level, which, which, which is, includes us, includes the city of Jerusalem in, in, in some of the, the poorest cities in Israel. Um, this is a clear reflection of the fact that there are, that, that one third of Jerusalem is, is, um, is, is East Jerusalem, who are, who are not actively contributing to the, econ to the Israeli economy or to the municipal economy. And another full third of the city are ultra-Orthodox Jews whose lifestyle is one of austerity, ideologically one of austerity, and many of them choose to study rather than work. Um, so we have two very, very poor, uh, uh, two thirds of the, of the city who are very poor. And um, So you're walking a very fine line, aren't you? Because you've got these different communities which you have to be sensitive to, but on the other hand, it's difficult because if they're not paying the council tax, they're not paying you know, they're not working in, in the society. It must be very difficult. It's even more of a challenge because, because our own parties um, really value, or values or ideology is the common good. So we really are not looking to marginalize any of the residents of Jerusalem. Even those of us who have, who have uh, uh, hawkish politics in the Arab-Israeli conflict um, do believe that Palestinian residents of Jerusalem are, are residents of the city and need to receive services. And, and because of that, we are committed to, 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 to fair play. And that's not to say that we're not, that we're not conflicted and there isn't, a, there isn't a battle for resources. So it's a very delicate walk. Um, and that's one of the things that brings me as a rabbi. Um, is that to, to me, this is a spiritual quest. In other words, how do, we begin, how do we resolve our differences in ways which don't divide, but ways which create unity? And that, th that to me, is the ultimate challenge. It's not, it's not kumbaya, because when you have to draw a red line and fight a battle over something which is just, then you have to do that. Um, and and, uh, and, and you know, pulling out the guitar and singing doesn't make, doesn't make the disagreements go away. And at the same time, a very deep and strong commitment to maintaining Jewish unity and also maintaining Jerusalem as a city which has, which has international um, um, asp you know, aspirations and connections and, uh, and vision. I would even say universal vision. You know, how do you maintain all of that at once? That's that that is um, the, the the delicate and very difficult dance that I'm passionate about right now. And do you get opportunity because there are other rabbis, I guess, in uh, the council? Do you get chance to meet together as rabbis or? So we definitely interact as rabbis. Um, as a matter of fact, in my in my own party, there's a, a, a reform Jewish rabbi um, who has a very different spiritual path than I than I do. And yet we share uh, this vision of the common, the common good for the city. Um, and of course, there are also ultra-Orthodox rabbis. And, and we differ greatly as a modern Orthodox rabbi um, and um, you know, one who, who is engaged in the secular world and engaged in general cult culture. Um, I, I definitely do not see eye to eye on many, many issues. Um, and yet, when, uh, when the time comes for the afternoon prayers and we need to gather a quorum of 10, so we're counting each other and we're praying together to the one, to the one true God of Israel. And um, 
So, so I think that there is a, a sharing that's happening on a deep level, um, despite the fact that that sharing is, and the, the Jewish tradition has a great, uh, you know, from, from time immemorial, the Jewish tradition has been one of disagreement in the, it, within unity. If you open up the Talmud, it's really a book of disagreements, of rabbis who disagreed with one another, and that, you know, that's part of our, part of our pa passion it, it's for a truth. A positive disagreement, it's not, uh, uh, if, that, if I can put it like that, um, it's a way of uh, digging deeper. It's a passion for truth, and it, and it, and it, and it really springs from a monotheistic uh, faith that there is such a thing as truth. Um, but also a sense that it can be elusive to the human, to the human mind, and that, and that maybe perhaps it's big enough that it also contains elements which seem contradictory to us, but from a divine perspective are actually completing, what, completing one another. And I feel like that's, that again is, is the reason that, the, that, that, that this is holy work to my, yeah. to my mind. And, and talking of that, we, you know, the audience would be very interested to know because of um, y your work with the Christian community and um, uh, how is it? How do you feel about the? There's a lot of Christians now becoming interested in Israel, becoming interested in Zionism, becoming interested in Jerusalem. Suddenly wanting to learn from the Torah, and uh, how 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 is it for you? All these things. It very to me. First of all, it, it's very clearly a blessing, um, despite the fact that we have theological, deep theological differences, um, and and we're all aware of those of those theological differences. The, I, I think we also share a tremendous amount, and I think that the the, the work that we that we that the world needs to bring it closer to God and closer to good, there are many many things that we can do together. Um, I also I also believe that that um, the there's a place in me which is very pluralistic, um, and it simply it simply comes from a a certain sense of um, you know when all is said and done, but then again what do I know? Uh, you know how much of the world is mystery? And um, and, in that, and that leads me to a place where, where I really feel a deep respect for people who have different different opinions, and, and and I think that that also is is a crucial element of bringing more light and love to the world, having that perspective. Um, I will say that I that I feel like th there is a um, it's important to me that the Christians that I have developed relationships with are uh, you know don't come and approach the Jewish people with an agenda. Of conversion, and um, you know, and, I, and uh, you know that that's a sensitive issue for us, and uh, I, you know, I don't think that that's a secret. But I have found that many Christians understand and appreciate that, and appreciate that an encounter has to be a respectful encounter. Um, it has to be an encounter which is very upfront about what's what's shared and what's not shared. Um, and in that respect, I believe that when Jews and Christians cooperate with one another in the correct way, God smiles. And it's amazing that this this is happening in this time of you know Jerusalem is changing and, and Christians are starting to uh, take an interest from all over the world and you know there'll be people watching in at home who are so excited to see you and you know that this is really an answer to their deep longing to know depths from the Bible and uh, to see Jerusalem and it's n Jerusalem is now being uh, it's its 50th year next year that's yeah, right where we are, we are. We are, right. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are entering the celebrations of, uh, of the fiftieth year of uh, since of the reunification of Jerusalem, and um, that is um, uh, it's a celebration of, of, an, of an amazing miracle, and um, and, uh, and, it, and and we stand. To, you know, it's a great time to visit, by the way, because there's, there's going to be many many uh, uh, unique activities and events and celebrations, and um, you know so. So, so, so I'm glad you brought that up because again, it takes takes me back to to, to the, the to, to the extension of that invitation. That now is the time. Thank you so much for coming across today and joining us. Thank you so much for being with us on the Israel First Television program. Great to have you with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. So today we are learning the ninth letter of the Aleph Bet. And this letter is Tet. And the letter Tet also represents goodness. And one of the words we with, with start with this letter, Tet, is Tov, which means good. And so you will say, oh, Ze Tov, this is good. Ze Tov, this is good. And also the first time when you see Tov in the Hebrew is very important and is in Genesis 1.4 when God is saying God, which is the name Elohim, saw that the, the light was good. And, and this is 
the first day in Genesis 1, okay? So this one, when we see the letter Tet, is to look at the goodness. And God is good all the time. So he's called the one who is good and who does good, which is very important because it's a very important precept. God is always good. We don't always understand his ways, but he's good. So in Hebrew, it's like Tov u Metiv. So Tov is the one who is, and Metiv is the one who is doing good. So God is good, and what he's doing also is good. Okay? Now, we will learn some very simple words together, and you can, you can learn it at home, and you can use it. Okay? So you can say, Boker Tov which means good morning, good morning, Bokotov. And which is interesting because here in, in uh, Israel, when you say Bokotov to somebody, the other person will answer Bokotov. And this comes exactly from Genesis 1.4. You see, the, the Hebrew letters really carry all the things from the Torah, from the Bible, and people are using it in daily life. So Bokotov and the other uh, one will say Boke Or, because Or is the light. And that is what we saw in the passage, where which is like, God saw that the light, Or, was good, Tov. Okay? Another one to say, good night, Laila Tov. Laila Tov, good night. And before the night, we say, Erev Tov, which is good evening, good evening, Erev Tov. You see, we've learned again some few words in Hebrew today. And we will see you next time. See you for this time. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Israel First television program. We love to hear from you. Uh, please send us your emails to info at israelfirst.org. Visit the website www.israelfirst.org. And don't forget, with a program that looks at the land, the people, and the language.